I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He's an old friend. Uh, he and I met back when he was still a trial lawyer. He was still a radical back then. Uh, he is a former presidential candidate. He was the nominee for the presidency of the United States, the Green Party of the United States in 2004. He is a Liberty Tree Fellow. He is here as a co-founder of the Move to Amend Coalition, which is the nation's largest, most broad-based coalition working to not only overturn Citizens United, but to build a movement for constitutional reform here in the United States. He was uh, the best man at my wedding. <laughs> a lot of family in the room. Please welcome my favorite Texan, David Cobb. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, all of those things are true. And I quit my law practice in disgust because I realized that even if I could get individual justice for an individual client, the system is rigged, right? I want to be clear, the system isn't broken, it's fixed, right? And so when Tamika was asked the question about radical, did you notice she did not bat an eye, right? She said it has to be radical. And you know why? Because we need a new system. And the word radical just means fundamental or at the root. So the reality is, sisters and brothers, that, and thank you for opening up the space to speak in that uh, direction, Professor. Sisters and brothers, if we actually believe that we're going to have to be a new system, we have to be radical. We have to actually acknowledge that this system is fundamentally racist, fundamentally sexist, fundamentally class oppressive. Oh, and by the way, these huge transnational corporations are going to destroy the planet that we depend upon for life itself if we do not stop them. How am I doing? See, thank you, because I think that we need to open up the space with one another to have honest conversation about what's happening now. So here's the thing. I actually know that we need transformational, radical change, and I know I might be able to lift that up and say, where, who can I work with right now to, that is willing to get down with the acknowledgement of the reality of white supremacy, the reality of patriarchy, the reality of capitalism, all premised upon exploitation and oppression? That conversation can happen. I have those kinds of conversations all the time. For today, in a very short period of time, I've been asked to talk about the corporation as an instrument from a legal perspective, and so I'm going to do that. And I want to be very clear, friends, the corporation is a construct. It's a tool. Nothing more, nothing less, right? The idea of the corporation, anybody know what language the word corporation is from? Latin. Corpus means? Body. And the suffix T-I-O-N just means to have or create. So literally the idea of a corporation is to have or create body. Le literally create the corporation, right? So the, and the thing is a corporation is a tool, right? And so I want to uh, be really clear about this. Like a tool can be used for good or ill. I am not anti-corporation. That doesn't make any sense. That'd be like getting into a, a fight with a council member about hammers. And he says, I'm pro-hammer. And I say, I'm anti-hammer. And we have that conversation. Because here's the thing. If I'm using a hammer to build a house that a houseless person is going to live in, what would we say about that hammer? Good hammer. If, however, I have a hammer in my hand and I'm lunging at Professor Calderon and my intention is to bash his skull in, what would we say about the hammer? It's a trick question! The hammer is not inherently good or inherently bad. The question is, what are we doing with the powerful tools that are at our disposal? And the reality is we have a racist, sexist, class oppressive system, so of course this concept of the corporation, which may be one of the most powerful tools clever, creative human beings have created, are being put to such horrific problems. The problem is not the reality of the corporation. The problem is a social, political, and economic system that is actually incentivizing the absolute worst aspects of human conduct and human behavior. So here's what I'm going to do in my very short amount of time. And the reason I wanted to actually get out in front and behind the podium is, number one, just so I could talk to y'all. I hope we'll have a little time for conversation.
information. But the other thing I'm going to do very quickly now is to actually jump right in to the legal system, right? We're talking about a new system. So what is the supreme law of the land? What is the document that's described on how our legal system is supposed to operate? What's that document called? Say it like you know it. The U.S. Constitution, right? How many of y'all have read that document? All right, good. A couple of hands go up. I wish there were more. That's all right. Here's what I'm going to do in a short amount of time is to share with you how the Constitution is supposed to operate. When you look at this document, it begins with three powerful words. We the people. Those are powerful and they should be. They're almost sacred in this country because they describe the concept that we, the people, have the authority to create the second concept, which is government itself. I like how some of my comrades say it. They say, the people should never be afraid of government. Actually, they say government should be... How many of y'all believe government is afraid of the people? Ah, it's a, right, it's a slow burn question. I got some hands go up. Professor Calderon went like this. Here's what I would tell you is, here's a follow-up question. If the government isn't afraid of us, why are they spying on us? If the government isn't afraid of us, why are they tracking us relentlessly when we gather together merely to have conversation? And if you still don't think government is really scared of us and the ruling elite are scared of us, I got one word for you. Occupy. Right? Because I had the privilege of going to 60, 70 Occupy encampments across this country. And you know what I saw? People talking to each other. That's what I saw. And it scared the bejesus out of the ruling elite in government because of the conversations that were happening. Because it wasn't just about sports and celebrity and technology and buying stuff. It was about fundamental questions like, why does 1% rule 99% in a country that claims to be a democracy? Why do 30% of the children go to bed hungry? in the richest country the world has ever seen. What the hell is the Federal Reserve and why does a private banking consortium control the U.S. money supply? Those are what, oh yeah, right? Those are the conversations that scare the ruling elite. They are what Audre Lorde calls unsanctioned conversations. We're not supposed to talk like that. Folks, the government is afraid of us because we actually have a hell of a lot more power than we dare to imagine, but we don't have it individually. Individually, I can't do anything to actually affect this system. But together, we are unstoppable. Yeah? Right? In the constitutional framework, it actually understands we the people create government because we the people are understood to be free and sovereign. And the word sovereign means the authority to rule. See, the king isn't sovereign in our system. Remember, we got a new system. We kicked the king out, created a new system of government. But government isn't sovereign over the people. In fact, in our system, government is supposed to be subordinate and accountable. Government is supposed to be subordinate it to whom? The people. Government is supposed to be accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. Let's continue. We the people are free and sovereign because we the people have rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. I'm going to stop for a moment as a lawyer to really nail this. You see, if anybody has a right to do something, it means they can do it. And you don't need my permission, the group's permission, government's permission. And not only that, but government cannot legitimately interfere with your ability to exercise your rights. My good friend Ben Mansky sometimes talks about this as this is the place that even the government cannot go forward. There are certain things that are sacred as individuals, our right to speak, our right for our opinion. Those things, these human rights are not subject to the political process. This is a very powerful idea. Our rights are sacred. The Constitution actually does not create these rights. The Constitution, properly understood, is supposed to recognize rights, human rights. And I dare say, uh, the, one of the prior speakers, let's lift up the fact that the imaginary lines called nation states actually have nothing to do with human rights. Don't get alarmed, it's just one button. But you see that right down there? For those of you in the back, I'm pointing at my belly button. If you're too scared or shy to check here in this public place, 
Please go home tonight. Make sure you have one. Because if you do, you too have human rights that are sacred. And it doesn't matter what nation state you are from, whether you have something called citizenship, human beings have inherent and alienable rights. And that is what our system is supposed to acknowledge. Duties are different because duties are responsibilities. The people have rights, government has duties, government does not have rights over the people. Government only has duties. And where do governmental duties come from? Well, remember, all power resides with the people. Power to the people was not merely a Black Panther Party chant, although it was. It was also, at the core, the idea of every revolutionary moment that has ever taken place. The recognition that the people have the power of sovereignty to, to govern ourselves. But here's the thing, y'all, like, you can't gather together, like, how many, what is the population more or less of Santa Barbara? 90,000. 90, so I will celebrate that 90,000 people in Santa Barbara hold all the political power, but I would hate to be at a meeting where 90,000 people came together to say, where should stop signs go? Right? And I like political meetings, but I would not go to that one. Because not only stop signs, you'd have to say, well, what are we going to do about wastewater? Or any of the other myriad decisions that you as an elected official have to make. You can't make that with 90,000. Oh, by the way, what is the population of Santa Barbara County? What about the state of California? You see where I'm going with this? We cannot actually have direct democracy across an entire system for everything that we want. In our system of government, yes, the people hold all the power, but we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government. Do we delegate all our power to government? No, we only delegate enough power for government to perform the duties that we, the people, have told them to perform. And how does government discharge their duties? They write public policy and law. And there is going to be disagreement about that, friends. Maybe you've noticed in this election cycle that there are disagreements about public policy, and that's okay. I think that we're losing something when we forget how important it is to be able to engage in vigorous public discourse and disagreement with people and still come away saying, I respect you as a human being, even though I completely disagree with you. And look them in the eye as a human being and acknowledge that humanity and say, I'm going to fight you like hell in the court of public opinion, but I still respect you as a human being, even though you're wrong. <laughs> right? And maybe even a little humor in it. All I'm getting at is public Policy is going to be debated, and that's okay. But the one thing that no public law can ever do, because we talked about this under the concept of constitutional rights, no public law can violate anybody's private rights. And now that I've taken this 10 minutes or so to lay out this, I will tell you now in one sentence how the U.S. Constitution is supposed to operate. Now, it's a run-on sentence to be sure, but it's still just one sentence. Watch this. In the U.S. Constitution, we, the people, are free and sovereign because we hold all the political power. But we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government, which we will always hold to be subordinate and accountable, and we will charge government with the duty to write public policies and laws at the local, county, state, and even federal level. But the one thing that no public policy or law can ever legitimately do is to violate the private rights of the free and sovereign people who live under our Constitution. Ta-da! Right? I mean, isn't that pretty good? I do this presentation all across the country. It almost never fails that people erupt in applause. Because when you say it the way I just did, it's so beautiful, right? Individual rights will be protected and respected, but we'll have a public process by which public civil discourse is made. But the public political process cannot violate anybody's inherent and alienable individual rights. This is so awesome. This is wonderful. We should try that in this country. <laughs> This would totally work. And I'm not joking. This is beautiful. This is brilliant. And I'm also going to say we've never experienced it. Because as a white man, before I go one second further waxing poetic about the Constitution, a quick time out. Somebody tell me what year the Constitution gets ratified. What year does the Constitution become the supreme law of the land? The answer is 1789. And so in 1789, people... Who was a legal person who could claim the beautiful rights and privileges of this document? What were their characteristics? We know it. Let's say it out loud. White. Male. 
property owners. That's a lot of restrictions. You know what percentage of the adult human beings living in the newly created United States of America could actually claim to be legal persons with rights protected by this document? What percentage do you think? 1%, right? The 99% is pretty, pretty cool, but it's not 1%. Don't be so cynical. It's 5%. I'm not making this up. Ask Mansky, he's done the research. 95% of the human beings living in the newly formed United States of America were not legal people because they could not claim the rights of the Constitution. It took social movements, broad, deep, conscious, politically educated social movements that actually transformed the legal definition of who was a person and who could actually assert those rights. Another way to say it is this document it's beautiful in its, in its theoretical construct, but in the reality of its implementation, this document did not protect the indigenous human beings. They were actually subject to intentional deliberate genocide, and this document allowed it. This document did not prevent the enslavement of Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun to this country and forced to build it with slave labor. This document codified it and encouraged it. This document did not protect women, Women were chattel property. They weren't people at all. And here's the other thing. Don't forget, most of the white men were not people. Most of the white men at this time were indentured servants or second-class citizens. The reality is a small ruling elite were able to literally govern the country claiming to be a democratic republic when they never were. And so... The point is, the definition of who is a legal person is at the core of really assertions of sovereignty and our ability to move forward. And now let's finally get to the concept of the corporation. Most dominant institution on planet Earth today. You know what it once took to form a corporation? You actually had to get a majority vote of the state House of Representatives and the st state Senate, and then the governor had to sign it. Think about that for a moment. Does that sound anything like corporate charters today? No, what did I just describe? Majority vote of the state house, majority vote of the Senate. Governor signs it. Say it louder. Legislation. The founding of this country for 150 years to create a corporate charter with limited liability was a political act that required state legislative pronouncement. And they were only good to five, for five to ten years, at which point the charter automatically dissolved. And if you wanted to continue with limited liability, you had to reapply politically. Oh, and get this. If you were granted the privilege, not the right, it's not a right, it's a privilege to have limited liability, then here's the thing. If you were granted that privilege, all you could do was specifically that type of business. And if you did any other type of business, you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Corporate charters were routinely revoked for going ultra virus. In Latin, it means beyond the authority because the founders understood that the corporation was authorized to do specific things. Now, I'm not here. I, I hope it's clear. I'm not a founder fetishist. I'm not one of these that say, oh, the founders were great. Because remember, slavery, the, 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 the genocide of the indigenous human beings, you know, that the, the patriarchy dripping on it. But what I'm saying is the founders did understand that the corporate tool was a political act created under the law and it should be properly controlled. So here's the thing, friends. Now that we know that it takes an action of state government to create a corporate charter, we understand that the corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable. We understand that the corporate charter describes the duties of what a corporation can or cannot do. And we understand that a corporation should only exist if it serves the public interest. Isn't it obvious that if this is going to have any meaning that a corporation should go here, which is, by the way, where it was for 150 years in this country. Again, the founders did not get everything right. In fact, they got almost everything wrong, in my opinion, except this notion of the corporation and this notion of rejecting monarchy as a form of rule. Their problem was that they actually did not embrace humanity as being people. In fact, that's a huge problem, isn't it? But here's my point, y'all. If it is true that the corporation is just a tool, 
then we can say what it can or cannot do. And then we could actually create the peaceful, just, democratic, ecologically sustainable world that the overwhelming majority of people want. Polling data makes it very clear that people don't want to live in this system, right? Like, if you, if you just ask any sociologist, if you ask any uh, polling expert who understands how to actually take opinion polls, it's very clear people do not want to live like this. The legal system, the political system, the economic system have all conspired so that a small ruling elite are actually controlling it. And here comes the punchline. When the U.S. Supreme Court comes waltzing in, and in an act of supreme judicial activism, for people who know that phrase, says, notwithstanding prior court decisions, notwithstanding prior history, notwithstanding founders' original intent, we are no longer going to treat this corporation as if, as if it is the artificial entity created under the political process that can be controlled. No, no. Now we have to treat a corporation as if it's a person with inherent and alienable rights. That perverts the whole thing. Here's the punchline. This concept of a corporation being a person with constitutional rights means now that corporate lawyers can go into court and overturn any law that we work our butts off. Environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws, laws around uh, fair and just immigration policy. You can't name a law that a clever lawyer, and I'm not even that good, right? But you can't even name a law that I can't, using this doctrine of corporate constitutional rights, help somebody to figure out a way to challenge that law in, uh, in the courts. My friends, sisters and brothers, the concept of corporate constitutional rights steals our sacred right to govern ourselves. So at the end of the day, if we are going to have a new system, and I think by now those of us who have been here all day, it's very clear we must have a new system. And it's not just a new economic system, is it? We need a new political system. We need a new cultural system. We need systems that actually celebrate life. And can I say love and compassion? Right? Can't we actually say love and compassion at places and gatherings like this? That that's actually what we want to lift up? Like, things like liberty and freedom actually mean something, right? So here's what I'm here to tell you. There is a movement happening that actually comes out of the teach-in phenomenon. I recall when Ben Mansky uh, first, I, I, he came onto my radar uh, doing things called the democracy teach-ins, where as an undergraduate student himself, he was organizing these spaces where people were collectively coming together and teaching each other what we understood and knew about the legal system and about the role of the corporation. So what I'm telling you is this. There is a group and an organization that I'm part of called Move to Amend. How many of y'all have heard of Move to Amend? Oh, I feel pretty good about that, right? Move to Amend specifically exists in order to build a movement for a constitutional amendment to abolish this illegitimate idea that corporations have constitutional rights. But here's the thing. We actually want to go further. I look forward to the day when the movement looks at Move to Amend and say, just one constitutional amendment, you were thinking too small, right? So I want to be pushed by that. I want to be pushed by that idea. But here's the other thing. I, I'm going to conclude with this. Move to Men began in 2010. We were 12 people in the living room. Ben Mansky and I were two of them. So we have one-sixth of the entire founding of Move to Men in this one room. Today, we're 400,000 people and growing every day. We've helped 16 states pass resolutions of support. We've helped 600 communities pass resolutions of support, echoing Tamika Drew's concept of using that phenomenon around Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the thing I'm most proud of is we've been over, on over 300 ballots. That is, not just city council members voting, but actual people being able to vote on whether or not they support this idea. Folks, we've been on the ballot 300 times. Guess how many times we've won? 300. We haven't lost yet. We've won everywhere we've been, right? I see your face over there. You're like, no, -uh. it's true. Look it up. What I'm telling you is this. Yes, we won in San Francisco and Boston and Madison, Gar. Okay, yeah, the liberal places. You know where else we won? Salt Lake City, Utah. 
We won in Waukesha, Wisconsin. My two Scotties back there in the back, they can tell, maybe somebody else knows about Waukesha. Hometown of Republican Tea Party Governor Scott Walker. They haven't voted for a Democrat for president or Congress in 40 years in Waukesha, Wisconsin. We were on the ballot there and we won. We won in the state of Montana. Yes, sir, that Montana, the one you're thinking about. The state of Montana in a statewide initiative. I'm from Texas, y'all, Montana, one of the few places that makes Texans look perhaps politically or culturally conservatives. Moved to a man was on the ballot there and we won 74% of the vote. What I'm getting at is there is a way to engage this conversation that cuts across political ideologies. It cuts across political labels, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian, Independent. There is a way to have a conversation that actually inspires people to recognize that actually the concept of the United States of America as a democratic republic, if it was actually honest and said all people are people, that's something that we can aspire to. And I'm gonna conclude with this. We should have vigorous debates and encourage the kind of disagreement that those debates have. I welcome those. But I also recognize this. At the end of the day, the only way that we the people are going to be able to exercise democratic control over the small ruling elite and the military industrial complex that they control and all the other implements of destruction is if we actually come together and agree on a basic principle of self-government. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what we're trying to do at Move to Amend. I encourage you to check us out online, www.movetoamend.org. Use your smartphone, you could sign up right now. And the other thing that you can do is come to talk to me or Ruthie or my colleagues. Would y'all all stand up that are part of the local Move to Amend effort? Because I want, through the course of the day, can I get a round of applause for these people that just stood up? Because they're the ones actually doing the work day in and day out. They'll be doing a workshop on Move to Amend. So I think we're done. Thank you so much. Hit me up. I'm here, there. I'm here for the whole conference. I want to keep talking to y'all.